So I'm going to look at left atrial size, function, strain. It's, it's a complicated sort of title, but really what does it all add? So if we think of the left atrium, we often think it's just the chamber on top of the left ventricle and really doesn't have much function. Doesn't really have uh, serve any specific function, but it actually modulates left ventricular filling, contributing about 30% of cardiac output. And this is particularly relevant in patients with heart failure or with diastolic heart failure. Now it acts as a volume sensor. It's a barometer of diastolic function. It's got some neuroendocrine properties. It secretes natriuretic peptides, which in turn communicates with the RAS pathway. And more recently, it's been demonstrated to be a prognostic biomarker. And I'm just going to show you a few snapshots of where left atrial volume is being used. This is work from Teresa Sang, and what she showed was following 400 patients uh, for MACE events, and you can see that the ones with the largest left atrial volume had the worst prognosis. And furthermore, when they looked at diameter versus area to volume, it was the left atrial volume that had the highest um, sort of pro prognostic value. Now, ischemic heart disease and... So ischemic heart disease and myocardial infarction is really you know, something that all of us deal with in clinical practice. This is a study from Moller and colleagues which showed an exponential increase in mortality in patients post myocardial infarction as their left atrial index volume increased. And similar reports from another group showing that an index left atrial volume greater than 32 mils per meter squared um, actually identified patients who had a worse prognosis. How about heart failure? Certainly an increasing group of our clinical practices heart failure. These two uh, studies refer to patients with systolic heart failure. The first, um, the ECHO substudy of the Valiant trial, again showing that the larger left atrial tertile did worse, and similar results from a more recent heart and soul study. Here you can see that if you have a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%, was pretty much the same poor prognosis as someone with a very large left atrial volume. Another sort of clinical domain where evaluating left atrial volume is invaluable is diastolic dysfunction. And here you see a graded response of left atrial volume as the severity of diastolic dysfunction increases. And in fact, in the current guidelines, evaluating an index left atrial volume is one of the four key measures. An important caveat though, you can't use it in patients who've got atrial fibrillation or significant mitral valve disease because the underlying pathology can affect the left atrial volume. So now that we've sort of established that left atrial volume may be important or size may be important, historically we simply used a diameter, whether it was an M mode or 2D diameter, but the left atrium enlarges asymmetrically. And to capture that asymmetric enlargement, we need to use a volume. The other thing that's become evident, particularly with MRI, is that the longest axis of the left ventricle doesn't really line up with the longest axis of the left atrium. So when you're acquiring a left atrial image, you need to maximize the left atrium, which often means you foreshorten your left ventricle. It's just a practical tip. Um, and essentially, it's a biplane left atrial volume, either area length or modified Simpsons. We now have 3D echocardiography and also MRI and CT, and we need to tailor the imaging modality that we use based on the patient evaluation. A very important consideration is that we index that left atrial volume to body surface area, and this sort of makes up for gender differences and also for differences in body size. The current recommendations, this is from 2015. Um, they were 10 years after the last one. They had more studies and more interest in the left atrium. And the cutoff now for an enlarged index left atrial volume is 34 mils per meter squared, which sort of lines up with the diastology guidelines as well. They recommend a modified biplane Simpsons technique. And there's early work suggesting that 3D 
um, left atrial volume assessments are more reproducible. With 3D, we now have fairly simple techniques. Previously, it was multi-slice imaging. Uh, unfortunately, those dots there have moved um, in translation, but essentially with just plotting five dots at two each at the mitral annulus, one at the apex, you can generate images like this. Um, most of this work has come looking at modules which have been developed for the left ventricle. And it's only recently that there are specific modules being generated to look at left atrial volumes. There is data from this multi-center trial uh, from Victor Moravi's group showing that 3D echo is superior to 2D echo. If you have a look at the graphs here, you can see the Bland-Altman spread is much wider when you use 2D as compared to 3D echo. And if you look at characterization of normal versus abnormal, 2D failed 25% of the time, whereas 3D failed only 4% of the time. So the key points about evaluating left atrial volume, there's really a good correlation, whether it's 2D, 3D, MR, or CT. Echo tends to systematically underestimate left atrial volume. The important caveat is you can't change the modality when you're serially following up a patient. And um, some of the limitations with 3D or with CT is the lack of normative data and prognostic data, but that's certainly increasing. Now, if we just change gears a bit and we look at left atrial function, so the gold standard is hemodynamic assessment. So atrial function is actually more complex than we think, and it has multiple phases. So when the mitral valve closes, blood from the pulmonary veins fills the left atrium, and the atrium enlarges, and this is its reservoir function. When the mitral valve opens, that blood passively enters the left ventricle. This is conduit function, and it's really a surrogate measure of left ventricular filling. And finally, at end diastole, when the atrium actively contracts, we get contractile function. Now, can we measure something so complex using just simple tools like echocardiography? And in fact, we can. So if we measure maximum left atrial volume at end systole, minimum left atrial volume at end diastole, and then a pre-P volume. So this is the volume of the atrium before active atrial contraction. We can then compute various phasic volumes. Just a limitation of these volumetric techniques. It's a far field structure. You need to really optimize the measurement. And we don't have a lot of normative data for atrial phasic function. Now, traditionally, for years, we looked at transmitral flow, and we measured the peak A velocity. And this is really a measure of blood flow during active atrial contraction. We could measure the peak A. We could measure its VTI. We could measure it as a fraction of total VTI. And peak A velocity has also been integrated into left atrial ejection force calculations. The downside of this is that you can only assess atrial function when a patient is in sinus rhythm. And we really want to assess atrial function in that large group of patients with atrial fibrillation. And using transmitral PK velocity um, does not permit this. With tissue Doppler, you can also measure A prime velocity, so um, just here. And that correlates well with volumetric left atrial ejection fraction. You could look at regional atrial function, which was important for the electrophysiologist. But with tissue Doppler, you're again measuring velocity relative to the transducer. And therefore, you are affected by tethering or if there's scar tissue. So more recently, we've had the advent of, left uh, of strain measurement. And certainly in the left ventricle, it's been shown to be a marker of subclinical disease before left ventricular ejection fraction actually drops off. Now, what is strain? Strain is really a measure of myocardial deformation. And what we're looking at is a change in length. So if you have a look at this figure down the bottom, if you start with something which measures 10 centimeters, and then when it contracts, you get negative strain because it's compared to original length. And when it elongates, you get positive strain. Now, we can derive strain from tissue Doppler, 
from two-dimensional imaging and also from an, a more recent entity, velocity vector imaging. So this is a trace of a left atrial strain using tissue Doppler. With the ventricle, we use a nine by nine sample volume. Sean showed us how thin wall the atrium is. And so for tissue Doppler strain, you really need to change your sample volume to a thin, long one. So two by 10, we, we saw that the atrial walls were very thin. It's tedious. You've got to manually track it throughout the cardiac cycle, and you really need to have strong research fellows in a dark room doing these measurements, but very high temporal and spatial resolution. With the advent of 2D strain, it actually tracks the speckles in the myocardium. It's semi-automated, not angle dependent. We currently use packages that are developed for the ventricle, but we do get quite robust data from it. And essentially, you get traces depending on where you get the QRS. So if you were to get at the onset of the P wave, you first get negative strain because the atrium contracts, and then you get positive strain. So you can measure contractile function, reservoir function, as well as conduit function. So we're able to get that phasic left atrial function. You get a different sort of curve if you were to gate on the QRS, but the actual magnitude doesn't change. With VVI, or velocity vector imaging, it's speckle tracking plus endocardial border that's taken into consideration. One pitfall of 2D strain is we're assuming that speckle stays in the imaging plane, and there's no guarantee that it does, and there's a lot of work now happening with 3D strain, and there are some early reports that you get more robust prognostic value. Its major limitation is its poor temporal resolution. So a very important tip, speckle tracking is only as good as your 2D picture is, and you really need to practice it before you decide to use it in a patient. So I think the left atrium is really very dynamic. It's got physiological changes, pathological changes, but to just summarize, I think the three conditions where it's most important, atrial fibrillation, hef pef or diastolic dysfunction, and mitral valve disease. And I'm going to just provide a very brief overview of some recent studies in the literature. Do we have normal values? Uh, this is a multi-center trial which looked at normals, about 350, and they came up with the lowest expected reservoir function of the left atrium of 23% of strain. They applied this cutoff to patients with diastolic dysfunction. And what was interesting is that even if you had normal left atrial volume or normal volumetric measures, your strain could be reduced. Again, showing you that it's perhaps more sensitive. And this is data similar to what was seen in the left ventricle. Our own group looked at healthy aging, and once again, we found that volumetric changes occurred in the seventh decade, where a strain started to go off in the fifth decade, suggesting that it can pick subclinical disease. Moving on to diastolic heart failure, um, this was work from the Baylor group, and they looked at patients with reduced ejection fraction, with preserved ejection fraction, and with patients with just diastolic dysfunction. They measured invasively the wedge pressure. Left atrial strain correlated well with wedge pressure and was also able to discriminate well between the three groups. Does it have prognostic value? About 300 patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and when they followed these patients longitudinally, a global strain less than 30% tended to predict those who were going to develop persistent atrial fibrillation. So we may need to use these measures before we decide to do therapeutic intervention on our patients. How about with um, embolic disease? So this is just the one study in a small group of patients, again showing that a global longitudinal strain had incremental value, and this is shown here in this bar chart, 
where, when you add it to CHADS vascore, presence of anticoagulation, and volumetric left atrial function, and that strain could separate those who developed an embolic event and also those who would die from an embolic event, but only one study, so a lot more work that needs to be done. Similar data have been obtained from patients uh, undergoing mitral valve surgery, and it's suggesting that atrial strain is more powerful than even ventricular strain, simply because I think it's a thin wall chamber and therefore is going to respond earlier to that regurgitant volume. What does strain correlate with? There's one study which has actually looked at histopathology and has shown an inverse correlation. So as fibrosis goes up, strain tends to drop off. There are similar data from MRI studies as well. Can we use this clinically? So this was a study where they looked at patients with hypertension who weren't treated. They then treated them with ACE inhibitors or um, ARB. And what you see is that there was an increment in strain if left atrial volume wasn't too enlarged and if you had good control of systolic blood pressure for a period of six months. In atrial fibrillation, it's been demonstrated to predict those who will maintain sinus rhythm after cardioversion. And more recent data in patients who are undergoing pulmonary vein isolation. We can also use it to localize regional strain. And Anita Boyd, who did this work with us, looked at patients who had undergone uh, AF ablation and showed a differential reduction in the inferior and lateral segments of the left atrium. So just to summarize, in terms of left atrial size, the atrium enlarges asymmetrically. We need to look at a volume and a biplane left atrial volume. It appears that 3D data is superior. We need to optimize left atrial volume. I've just had time to show you how maximum left atrial volume is a prognostic marker. There are a few studies saying that minimum left atrial volume, which may correlate more with your end diastolic pressure, is also a powerful prognostic marker. Pitfalls of this measurement you need to optimize your left atrial uh, acquisition. When we use left atrial index volume to categorize diastolic dysfunction, we need to make sure they don't have AF or mitral valve disease. And really the utility, I think it's still underutilized um, in clinical practice in terms of getting a biplane left atrial volume. In terms of function, we have multiple parameters particular utility in HEFBEF. It appears to be more sensitive than left atrial volume change. It does have prognostic value. There are examples of how we can use it to measure response to therapy and determine success of treatment. Will we actually improve the value by combining volume and function? And that's really an area that hasn't been explored much. Um, pitfalls, it does require some training and expertise. Normal values not standardized. And while I showed you lovely curves, there is still vendor-dependent differences. There's a big move by the ASC and um, the European Echo Association to sort of have a common platform. That's not happened yet. And 10 years down the track, we're still using a left ventricular algorithm to look at left atrial strain. So really, it's a dynamic chamber. And while I've covered mainly the echo aspects, it's an exciting time where you can use CT, you can use MRI, and you need to tailor the imaging modality based on the question you're asking. So thanks for your attention.